Hello and welcome to Prof. Dale's Property Video Number 14. The topic of this video is Restraints on Alienation. Now to follow the discussion in this video, you'll need to know about estates and land. And so if you're not familiar with the system of estates and land, you might want to go back and review Prof. Dale's Property Video Number 5. What is a restraint on alienation? Well, it's a cause. It could be in a deed, a will, a covenant running with the land, or a simple contract. But one way or another, it's a cause that purports to either prevent an owner from transferring title to his or her land, or to impose some legal burden on the right to transfer the land. What sort of legal burden do we mean? Well, it might be a duty to go back and get the consent of a former owner. It might be an obligation to transfer the land to some third party instead of to the person that the owner wants to transfer to. So all of those are examples of restraints on alienation. Now, restraints on alienation as a practical matter occur in two situations in the United States. The first one is with gifts to family members or to charities. These are typically situations where the owner either doesn't want the recipient to retransfer the property or doesn't trust the recipient to make a sound or wise retransfer or resale of the property. So they want to intervene and stop that from happening or to give their consent to it. A second situation, and we'll talk about this later in the video, is the right of first refusal. And essentially, that's where a landowner says, if I decide to sell this property, I'll give you the first opportunity to buy it. The courts regard rights of first refusal as restraints on alienation and might strike them down on that ground. Traditionally, there are three types of restraints on alienation, and you need to be familiar with the terminology describing the three. The first one is a disabling restraint, and it's basically a clause that says, if the owner of the land purports to make a transfer, the transfer won't work. No transfer will occur. The owner will still have title to the land and no title will be moved. A second type of restraint on alienation is the forfeiture type. It's a clause that says, if the owner of the land makes a purported transfer, it won't transfer title to the person who's intended to receive the title, but instead, the title will go back to the grantor, the person who gave them the land in the first place, or to some specified third party instead. So basically that causes them to lose title to the property, but not to be able to transfer it to the person that they wish to transfer to. The third type of restraint on alienation is the promissory restraint. And that's basically a covenant or an agreement, maybe a contract that says, I promise not to transfer the property or not to transfer it without your consent. Let's take a look at some examples of restraints on alienation and see if we can categorize with the three categories, forfeiture, promissory, and disabling, which type each of these is. The first one, the grantor conveys land to A and says to A, but A agrees never to transfer the land without my consent. The key here is the word agree, which is the equivalent of promise or covenant this is a promissory restraint on alienation. The second example, the grantor conveys to A, but says the land is to revert to me if A transfers it without my consent. Now, this is a classic example of a forfeiture restraint where the property will be taken away from A if A makes a purported transfer without consent. It won't go to the transferee that A has in mind. It'll come back to the grantor instead that's a forfeiture, a taking away of A's title. The third example says to A, but any attempt to transfer the land without my consent will be null and void. Well, obviously, this is a disabling restraint on alienation. It purports to say that if A tries to make a transfer of the land, the transfer simply won't work. Nothing will transfer. So that's a disabling type restraint on alienation. Now, here are a couple of more examples, but these are, as it turns out, not restraints on alienation at all. The first one says, I grant this land to A, who promises never to operate any commercial business on the land without my consent. 
The second example is taken from an actual case, a Missouri case in 2007, and it's similar to the first one. It says the use of the described property is hereby restricted to the erection and operation of a Kentucky Fried Chicken store and may be used for no other purpose. Well, both of these basically have the same thrust. What they do is prohibit certain uses of the property. What you need to do is distinguish between restraints on alienation and restraints on use because they're completely different concepts. If it's a restraint on use, the chances are extremely high that the court will enforce it without any problem at all. Restraints on use basically aren't considered to be bad. Restraints on alienation, on the other hand, are highly suspect and may be struck down. You'll notice that the language of both of these examples doesn't prevent the owner from transferring the property. It only prevents the owner from using the property in certain ways. That's not a restraint on alienation. So why don't courts like restraints on alienation? Why are they so willing to strike them down or hold them void? Well, one possibility is that they're harsh and unfair to an individual owner and courts are trying to relieve that burden. But there might be a broader reason as well that restraints on alienation are bad for the economy and therefore for society at large because they impede the most efficient use and development of the property. Now that's an appealing explanation, but it also causes us to ask a question. If this is the reason, then why don't we scrutinize restraints on use in the same way we scrutinize restraints on alienation? Both of them have the same potential for preventing the most efficient use or development of real estate. I don't think that there is a satisfactory explanation for the difference in treatment between the two, but the difference is very real. Now we're ready to talk about the ultimate question, when will the courts enforce and when will they strike down a restraint on alienation? Well, here are the rules, and you can consider these to be pretty solid black letter rules. The first is that all disabling restraints on alienation are void. Doesn't matter what type of estate we're restraining. This actually dates back to the statute quia emptoris passed by the British Parliament in 1290 AD, the very first legislative recognition of the fact that restraints on alienation might be struck down. A second rule is that some courts hold that forfeiture and promissory restraints on fee simple estates are void. Others, maybe a majority, say that such restraints are void only if they're unreasonable. Now notice that on this slide we've distinguished between disabling restraints, which are always void on any type of estate, and forfeiture and promissory restraints, on the other hand, which might be held void on a fee simple estate, and as we'll see on the next slide, will almost certainly be upheld on an estate that's less than a fee simple. So forfeiture and promissory restraints are usually upheld and enforced on estates that are less than a fee simple, such as life estates and leasehold estates. Even total or absolute restraints on these types of estates are usually upheld. What this means, for example, is that if you're a tenant with a leasehold estate and there's a clause in your lease that says you can't assign or sublet without the landlord's consent, the courts are almost certain to uphold that even though it is a total or absolute restraint because it's on an estate that's less than a fee simple. In some states, probably the majority of states, even restraints on fee simple will be upheld if the restraint is reasonable. So that requires us to look in those states if we have a fee simple estate that's being restrained, requires us to look at the restraint and decide whether it's reasonable or not. So what kinds of limitations would make a restraint on alienation reasonable? That's our next question. Well, here are some limitations that will make a restraint on alienation more reasonable. The first one is that the restraint is limited in time. For example, it might be limited to the lifetime of the grantor, or it might be limited to a specific number of years. By the way, you should notice that if the restraint is imposed on an estate that's less than a fee simple, 
it's inherently time limited because the estate itself is time limited and that means the restraint will be limited in the same way. A second way of making a restraint reasonable is that the restraint doesn't cover all types of transfers. For example, it might prohibit mortgaging, but it doesn't prohibit selling. If that's the case, the court might say, well, that's something of a restraint on alienation, but it's not too severe and we'll uphold it. A third possibility is that the restraint is reasonable because it excludes relatively few persons from the market for this property. For example, if it said no transfer can be made to the members of a specific family or people living in a specific town or on a specific other piece of property, those are relatively mild restraints because there are plenty of other people that the property could be sold to. And therefore, once again, it's likely that the court would find that restraint to be reasonable and uphold it. Here are some other factors a court might consider in deciding if a restraint was reasonable. If the property was a gift from the grantor to the grantee, the courts are somewhat more likely to uphold the restraint. Second, if the grantee is a charity, the courts are pretty willing to let donors to charities restrain what the charity can do with the property after they receive it. Third, if the grantor had some other good reason for imposing the restraint. Now, good reasons, of course, are somewhat subjective. But for example, if the grantor had reason to believe that the grantee was profligate or unreliable or had poor judgment, if there was a reason to believe that, then the court might be more likely to uphold a restraint on the alienation that was done by the grantee. Here's a chart that summarizes what we've learned so far about restraints on alienation. The first thing we can say is that if the restraint is a disabling type, it will be struck down and held void by the courts, whether it's on a fee simple estate or on an estate that's less than a fee simple, such as a life estate or a leasehold estate. Disabling restraints are void. On the other hand, if it's a promissory restraint or a forfeiture restraint, many courts will hold that on a fee simple, it is void, but other courts say it's only void if it's unreasonable. So on a fee simple estate, the courts may or may not evaluate the reasonableness of the promissory or forfeiture type restraint. If it's a promissory or forfeiture restraint on an estate that's less than a fee simple, such as a life estate or a leasehold estate, they're usually, I'd say, nearly always followed and upheld, but sometimes a court will inquire into their reasonableness and might strike one down if they decide that it is unreasonable. You want to be very careful, very cautious about racial religious or sex restrictions. In former times in the United States, covenants restricting transfer to black people or to Jews or to other groups were very common, but today those are almost certain to be illegal. One reason is that in the Supreme Court case of Shelley versus Kramer in 1947, the court held that if a state court enforced such a covenant, the state court was engaged in state action and because the state action was discriminatory, it would be in violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So since that time, racially restrictive covenants have essentially become unenforceable in America. Today, there's a much broader reason that covenants discriminating on the basis of race or national origin, religion or sex would be illegal. They would violate the Federal Fair Housing Act and similar state laws. So any sort of restraint on alienation that's based on race, religion, national origin, or sex is almost certain to be illegal under that statute. Now we're ready to shift gears and talk about rights of first refusal, abbreviated ROFR. What does the right of first refusal look like? Well, here's an example. The grantor, the owner of the land, says, if I receive an offer from a third party to buy my land, and I consider that offer to be acceptable, I will first notify you and give you an option to buy it on the same terms 
that the third party is offering me. Now you have to notify me within blank days if you want to exercise this option. You'll notice that there's a time limitation on when the, the person holding the right has to notify the property owner that they want to exercise the right of first refusal. That turns out to be very important, of course. So what do we know about rights of first refusal? Well, a right of first refusal, like any other option, could be held void under the rule against perpetuities if it's not properly li limited in time, such as limited to lives in being plus 21 years. If that's not a familiar concept to you, you want to go back and watch the video about the rule against perpetuities. However, even if a right of first refusal is valid under the rule against perpetuities, could it still be void as a restraint on alienation? The answer is yes, it's possible. There are two different tests, validity under the rule against perpetuities and validity as a restraint on alienation are two different concepts. So a court might decide it's valid under the rule against perpetuities and could still be void uh, as a restraint on alienation. Now you might say, well, does a right of first refusal really act as a restraint on alienation? Does it really prevent sale of the property? Well, not literally, because there will be a sale of the property if the right of first refusal is exercised, but it won't be a sale to the person to whom the owner intended to make a sale. The person with the right of re first refusal, in effect, will preempt that sale. And that might be enough to consider it to be a restraint on alienation. To be upheld as reasonable, a right of first refusal should have the following features. First of all, it ought to be limited in time. Now, some courts have upheld unlimited time right of first refusals. Some courts have struck them down. If you're not certain what the position of the courts in your state is, you want to be cautious about this. And the smart thing to do is to put in a time limitation. How long a time limitation is acceptable? Well, the lifetime of one of the parties should readily be acceptable. Likewise, a time period of up to 21 years, borrowing that from the rule against perpetuities, should also be acceptable. Any time limit that's outside those times might be questionable. A second feature that ought to be put in is that the holder of the right of first refusal ought to have a duty to respond, in other words, to accept or reject the offer within a reasonable time. Why? Because otherwise, the holder of the right of first refusal can kill the sale and end up not exercising the right himself and therefore leave the property owner with no sale at all. If your third party has made an offer and you tell him, well, I have to wait until I hear from the holder of my right of first refusal, and he says, well, how long will that be? And you say, well, I don't know. It could be a few days or a few weeks or maybe even a month or more. The person who's made the third party offer is likely to say, forget it. I withdraw my offer. I don't have that much time to wait. So the holder of the right of first refusal needs to have a duty to accept or reject the offer within a very short period of time. The smart thing to do if you're the, the owner of the property and are giving a right of first refusal is to make that time period extremely short, like 24 hours or 48 hours so that you won't have the risk of killing a third party's offer. The third thing that we ought to put in a right of first refusal is that the holder of the right should have a duty to approximately match the third party's offer for the property. In other words, to pay essentially the same amount the third, third party is offering to pay. It should not be a fixed price fixed in the right of first refusal itself because almost inevitably a fixed price will become inadequate due to inflation if it is in effect for a long period of time. Likewise, it shouldn't be a price that's discounted from the third party's offer by some percentage. For example, in one case, the holder of the right of first refusal had the right to buy the property at a discount of 11% below what the third party was offering. The court was very troubled by that because it seemed to put the owner of the property in the position of having to sell the property at a below market price, which the court thought was not economically efficient. 
So the point is that the holder of the right of first refusal ought to have to match the third party's offer for the property and not pay something less. That winds up our discussion of restraints on alienation. The next video, video 15, is about the law of waste. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.